So our thoughts today concern perhaps one of the most popular stories in the Gospels, but it's also probably one of the least understood stories in the Gospel, which is the story of the feeding of the 5,000, the sort of classic Sunday school story of Jesus on the hill with the great meadow and the vast crowd of people that get fed with the loaves and the fishes. There's some beautiful lessons in here and it's included in John's Gospel as one of the signs, a sign of Jesus' identity, of his mission and his ministry, a sign of the kingdom of God being amongst the people of God. So how does this all play out? Apart from just the miracle of the wonder of people, hungry people being fed, how does this speak to us about the, the deeper things of our Lord and his gospel? Well, I think there's a few clues that John gives us which really shine a beautiful light upon what's happening here. We're told that the people were put into groups, that they were hungry, they were looking for food. Jesus quizzes the, the disciples as to how they're going to solve this problem. They don't really know. They complain or they at least make excuses. And then Andrew brings a young lad in with his lunchbox and says, maybe this will help, which is in itself a nice display of faith. Um, but the story actually has a lot more going on than that. Jesus prays for the food, we're told he blesses it and it gets distributed and everyone has more than enough to eat. And then there's the detail about the number of baskets, 12 baskets that are gathered up because Jesus says let nothing go to waste. So the 12 baskets are, are gathered up and then the crowd are dispersed and there's a, but there's a key moment just as this is happening. So there's a lot going on, but two particular details I think really help us understand what John's trying to communicate. One is the detail of the number of baskets left over, 12. Now scholars are unanimously in agreement for once that the number 12 is a very clear allusion to the 12 tribes of Israel. And this is a fulfillment of prophecy, particularly through Jeremiah and Isaiah, where we are told that the one from our Lord, that the Messiah would come and would provide abundantly, would provide with bounty, come and eat food without cost. So Jesus here is really pictured as the one who's providing for Israel everything that they need in accordance with the prophecies made of him in the ancient past. And the 12 baskets are this clear picture that it's the 12 tribes that we're speaking of here, the nation of Israel. This is the one given to rule and to lead and to be the provision for, the full provision for the nation of Israel. Another detail that we're given, which I think is really the key to the whole story, is once the whole episode has played out, we're told that the people try to seize Jesus and make him king by force. Now, that's a real key moment because if you think about it, the, the Jews were very politically astute people. They were thoroughly aware of their circumstances, not so much as slaves of Rome, but definitely under the heel of Rome, under their power. So they were the lesser, they were the dominated people, the Israelites were. And so now they just saw something happen, which was stunning and literally had the potential to change the course of their history, their reality. If you think about what Jesus has just done, it's amazing. Not only has he fed a hungry crowd, but the politically astute thinkers in the crowd would have joined the dots real fast and realized, hang on, this guy just fed a vast crowd with nothing, literally with a few buns and a few fish. He created food for the masses without even breaking a sweat. So think about it. If you can create food to feed the masses, if you do the math, you can rule the world. If you can feed a town or a city with, with ease out of just a few buns and fish, you can raise an army and with that army you can conquer the nation and with that nation you can conquer the other nations. If you can provide food for free for everyone, you can rule the world. And so the people in the crowd, some of them probably thought, wait a minute, we can have a Jewish king, not only of our nation but of all the nations. Do you realize what's going on here? He can create food for free for everyone. That is a single perfect recipe, if you pardon the pun, to rule the world. So what does Jesus do with that proposal? Because they tried to take him and make him king by force, using this persuasion as the argument. Well, what does Jesus do? Well, we're told what he does. He withdraws, he retreats, he takes off into the hills. He loses the crowd and he 
makes his own way into the wilderness. Why is that? Because the people saw that here is one who can sit on the throne of the nations and Jesus will indeed one day sit upon the throne of the nations, but not on their terms. He will not do it by the brute force of military dominance or by the persuasion of free food. He will do it by the way that the gospel tells us he does it, which is love. It is self-giving. It is humility. It is sacrifice. He will not be made king by force and then use force to dominate the nations. He will persuade the nations rather with grace and truth. And that's what John is trying to convince us with from the very beginning of his gospel all the way through. Grace and truth is the way of the Lord and the way of the Lord's people. In John chapter 1, John actually says these bold words. He says, we have seen him. We have seen the glory of the only begotten, the one and only. We've seen his glory and he is full of grace and truth. Now it's interesting. It doesn't say he's full of power, which he was and he is. That is not the currency with which our Lord works. He works with grace and with truth, the unrestrained kindness of God being his grace. Truth being the full disclosure of God's reality and God's purposes upon the earth. So it's grace and truth that is the way of the Lord. And it is grace and truth that is the way of the Lord's people. So it's really a great way for us to examine our own lives and hearts to really realize that that's what it boils down to is that God's glory, his purposes, his grace, his kingdom is seen through us, not through brute power and persuasion, but it is seen through us by grace and by truth. And with that, he will sit upon the, the, the throne of the nations. He will cover the earth with his glory, as it were told, the waters cover the sea. And his glory is grace and truth. And I think John wants this story of the feeding of the 5,000 to be a, a sign for that, a reinforcement of that provocative and you know, beautiful truth for us. Our job in all of this, well, what, how do we do this? What's our job? Our job is really to do what Andrew and the young boy did, is just to bring our lunch, bring a few loaves and fish. Whatever we have is not enough, but that's not the point. Whatever we have is still to be given, still to be offered. And we're told that the Lord takes that which is offered to him and he breaks it and he blesses it and he distributes it. And it goes way further from his hands as it would do from ours. So just such a great story to give us something to ponder throughout the week. So bless you and until next time, peace.